we're going to be doing sort of three short presentations uh, and then kind of open it up to a discussion. Um, so the presentations and the talk itself are kind of motivated by the idea of why, what is income inequality, growing inequality in the United States, what impact does that have on American politics, and what ways can we, can we reverse that impact um, over time, uh, and, and, and what sort of dangers does it pose, and, and how have the lives of everyday people become less and less represented in, in politics. Um, so we're at three presentations. So uh, we have David Walsh here with history. He's going to start, and uh, after that, I'll give a presentation, and then uh, Keith Pearson uh, from Anthropology will do a presentation. So it's going to be shorter, and then we'll have about 30 minutes for discussion. <coughs> Hi everyone. I'm uh, David Walsh. I'm a PhD student here in the History Department. Um, I wanted to talk with subject uh, of my brief uh, presentation today is about the transformation of the Democratic Party from the 1970s to the present uh, into a more conservative, business-friendly party. Um, so, but, but more specifically about some of the structural roots of inequality in the United States. Now, we're all probably familiar by this point with uh, some of the more shocking statistics from 1979 until 2007. The top 1% in the United States received 36% of all gains in household income, uh, with the top 0.1% receiving a whole 20% of all gains in household income. Uh, fully 18% of all income earned in the United States in 2007 went to the top 1% of earners, and that number has only increased in the past 10 years. Uh, social mobility in the United States, even at the best of times largely a myth due to structural racism, has been essentially non-existent for the past few decades. So all of this has been known for a while. And there are a number of explanations for how economic inequality and immiseration have become the dominant facts in American life. Uh, globalization is one commonly proffered explanation. Technology is another. Um, and these explanations tend to have a, some aura of inevitability about them. You can't stop globalization. You can't stop technological innovation, et cetera. Uh, now, neither one of these things is necessarily true. We're currently experiencing a massive backlash against globalization in this country and elsewhere. And uh, technological change, to use a big grad school word, I apologize, is not a teleological process. It, it isn't necessarily something that is inevitable, building to a natural end point, despite what people who are similarity types would say. So let's set aside those issues for a moment, the juggernaut of globalization. And actually, let's just take technology out of the picture entirely. There are other two. There are two other interrelated explanations about how we got here that are worth thinking about, uh, particularly because they both relate to our current politics. Uh, I'm talking about two things specifically. One, the rise in the 1970s of a well-organized and well-financed business block in Washington, D.C. And two, at the same time, the massive decline in organized labor as a major social, political, and economic force in the United States. So I don't want to spend too much time on the development of the business lobby uh, in the 1970s, partly because this is a story that's by, well, by now pretty well known on the street. Uh, in the 1970s, business organizations increased uh, their spending in Washington and on political campaigns. By the early 1980s, uh, business PACs, political action groups, were spend, outspending labor PACs by an almost four to one margin. Uh, at the same time, prominent businessmen like Joseph Coors, the beer baron, don't drink Coors, uh, also because it sucks, but also because he financed the Heritage Foundation and the American Enterprise Institute, both conservative pro-business uh, think tanks, to advance a pro-business uh, political agenda. Um, so the traditional... Oh, sure. So the traditional story told by pundits is that this political organizing led to the conservative Reagan Revolution. Uh, which ushered in an era of conservative politics and policy. Now, that's not really true. We don't really have to get into it right now. Uh, I can, we can talk more about it in the discussion if you're interested in learning more. Uh, the point is, by the end of the 1970s, though, business had a muscular, organized presence in Washington, D.C. and elsewhere, with lots of funding and lobbyists, and the years of Congress people. So in 1977, the AFL-CIO and other labor unions go all in in pressing for something called the Common Citus Picketing Bill which would have made it easier to picket non-union construction work sites. Labor was pretty confident the bill would pass. The Democrats had commanded majorities in the House and Senate. Jimmy Carter was president. Uh, there was even hope of repealing most of the Taft-Hartley Act, 
but they wanted to start with this. Uh, thanks to an organized, uh, thanks to an aggressive lobbying effort by business organizations, the bill was defeated in the House by a vote of 217 to 205. Uh, so Labor redoubled its efforts in October to pressure Democrats to pass legislation to streamline the decision-making process of the National Labor Relations Board, uh, which would have made it easier to resolve union election disputes and increase penalties for companies that violated labor law uh, in suppressing organizing efforts. And the House passed this bill by 257-163. And again, this bill was expected to sail to an easy victory in the Senate, where there were 61 Democrats. But Republicans, led by then-junior firebrands Richard Luger, and uh, uh, Orrin Hatch, who is now the uh, president pro tempore of the Senate, filibustered. And with a handful of Democratic defections, Senate Majority Leader Richard Byrd was unable to establish cloiture. The bill never passed. This had two effects. One, it became clear that labor was on its own. If the unions couldn't win with Democratic control of Congress and the White House, they just couldn't win. <coughs> and indeed, private sector organized labor began a decline that has decimated its ranks. Two, this is the important part, with the political power of unions in decline, it meant that the Democratic Party, uh, with its more conservative wings already being courted by business donors, could no longer rely on organized labor for financing and organized political support. This is actually critical because it goes a long, long way to explaining how the Democratic Party transformed from the 1970s from a party with a working class base to the party we know today, which is dominated by affluent technocrats. And of course, this has other ramifications. Without organized labor, the Democratic Party by the late 1980s had become increasingly reliant on affluent social liberals, the NPR listening, latte simping, Volvo driving types, who might have also been the president of Harvard. Uh, and, uh, and also on business to meet its financing needs. Uh, this goes a long way, again, to explaining the rise of the centrist Democratic Leadership Council and its most prominent member, Bill Clinton, who steered the party in a more rightward direction, particularly when it came to economic policy issues. Not just economic policy issues, but things like criminal justice reform, welfare reform, etc., which are commonly associated with the Reagan Revolution, but aren't actually enacted until the 1990s under Bill Clinton and a Republican Party, a Republican controlled Congress. And so I think I'll leave it there, actually. I'll just reiterate that it's, it's not a coincidence that economic inequality began to accelerate, especially in comparison to other industrialized economies after 1980, when labor entered its apparently terminal decline. This had political ramifications in causing a rightward shift in the Democratic Party, and that none of this necessarily had to happen. It was a direct result of public policy action, or in this case, inaction, that triggered a cascade of results. Thank you. Um, so yeah, so I'm going to talk about the relationship between the kind of work we're doing these days, how that work gets represented in politics, and I'm going to make an argument that partly the reason why we see such low voter turnout numbers, particularly among lower and middle class Americans, is this precise reason that their reality is not reflected in politics. So I was interested in two questions here. One is, why is it that people don't vote? And then second, why is it that those who don't vote tend to be lower, you know, lower, lower class, or working class or middle class. And so the I, the questions were first answered by some data. So what we've seen over the past several years is a widening uh, in the voter turnout rates between classes. So rich people and uh, well-to-do people have a higher percentage of, uh, vote in a higher percentage in the electorate than poor and middle class people. Uh, and this has been a trend that's been continuing for some time. Uh, it's been a element of American politics. It's arguably been caused by both political parties. Um, so David's uh, presentation gives us a nice idea of why the Democrats might not want working class people to start participating more in politics. But I have a question. Yes. Is that also true when you stratify based on urban versus rural? So uh, if you go to rural, you don't have the same numbers. But when you go to urban, it's like half and half. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good question. So I'm not quite sure whether they certify that data by urban or rural. I do know I do know just by income level and voter turnout that you see poor folks turn out way less than rich folks do. Um, yeah. And also a question about the numbers. When you said there's a discrepancy in turnout, do you have numbers about this? On like percentage <coughs> more wealthy versus poor, how they break that up? 
Yeah, um, so the turnout numbers are kind of interesting. So, for instance, the last election, we had a voter turnout at 55%. Uh, but I believe of that, uh, folks who've earned under $10,000 a year, for instance, their voter turnout rate was around 30%. Um, and if you go and you stagger each income level up, you get three more percentage points of turnout. So people who make over a million dollars a year have a voter turnout rate of something like 89, 90%. So that's three percent per ten thousand dollar increase, you're saying? Or what? The, the tax bracket. Oh, tax bracket. Okay. Tax bracket increases. Yeah, are, yeah. are those numbers referring to registered voters or registered plus unregistered? Uh, re registered plus unregistered. So everyone. I believe everyone. Yeah, yeah. Eligible voters. Eligible voters. Right. Because um, if you don't turn out, it might, it might not necessarily be because, yeah, it might be because you're not registered also. But I believe that data refers to everyone. Um, so. With that in mind, uh, the fact that poor folks are participating more in politics, the question becomes why? What are the reasons uh, why they might be expressing this level of apathy? There are certain structural reasons. So we could talk about voter ID laws. We could talk about um, states that have moved away from early voting. We could talk about the fact that people vote on a Tuesday rather than on a weekday. Um, we can talk about general decline in uh, civic education in schools. I think there are a lot of different reasons. But one reason I think it's important to think about is the way that work gets represented in public conversations. So uh, as David noted, uh, union labor has declined over the past uh, 30 to 40 years in the United States, but also a dramatic shift in the US economy has been taking place throughout the last 50 years. So we've moved from a manufacturing uh, dominant economy uh, to a dominant service sector economy. Um, and by this, particularly for working class, middle class people, this means folks who work in your Walmarts, restaurants, um, the whole array of low-end service sector work, or low-pay service sector work, uh, that really kind of drives much of the economy that we have today. Um, but interestingly, those lives and those realities are not depicted by the two major political parties. So the Republican Party will often talk about uh, people needing to work harder, people needing to be more responsible for themselves, people needing to save money, and then in turn get an education so they can get out of a job, say at Walmart or McDonald's. The Democrat solution isn't really much different, right? So the Democrats for a while have been saying, well, we need to also fund greater education opportunities to get people out of this line of work and into work that's higher paying. So let the market decide what that work is worth and let people be able to participate better in the market. Now, Trump has offered a third option, which is a more populist option. His option has always been that we should bring manufacturing jobs to the United States, right? That's what he ran on, that's what people wanted, that's what people voted for him for. Um, but the data shows that, and the data and then sort of the research on manufacturing in the United States shows that over time, less and less jobs will be created by manufacturing, even as the U.S. retains its role as one of the top exporting economies in the world. So the U.S. is the third largest exporter in the world, um, yet manufacturing's decline uh, in the labor market has been pretty substantial. And it's mostly because of automation uh, that, that's done a lot of that work. It's mostly been efficiencies in, in factory and manufacturing work that have allowed companies to shed so much of that labor. And yet in the public imagination, we're still stuck on the idea that manufacturing is a good line of work, that it's stable, that people should be able to be employed in manufacturing, that, it, that people who work in factories should get paid higher wages. Um, in fact, this is not the history of factory work in the United States. Factory work in the, uh, in the beginning was actually seen as lower end work, it was dangerous, workers weren't paid very much money because the labor was expendable. And the reason why that changed is because of the labor movement. The labor movement not only changed the literal conditions of working in a factory, it created an ethic or a culture around factory. Right now, I think most of us are familiar with disparaging jokes about people who work at McDonald's. You've seen politicians on both sides of the aisle insult workers who work at Walmart, who work on basically every retail, every service area of profession. It doesn't have a place in national politics. Neither party thinks that, that that work is valuable. People think that work is a transitionary work. And the only populist, successful populist movement we have today has no role for service sector employees. It's all about bringing manufacturing back to the United States. 
I think that's a problem. So I think that in some ways the way that we think about work and what we're willing to value is distorting our sense of what we think is politically possible. And this is why people don't show up to the polls, particularly people who work at, pay, at the pay less, at the Walmart, at the Target, who make you know, minimum wage or slightly above minimum wage. The reason they're not showing up is because politicians have nothing for them. Um, and I think there are some solutions to this. So I think we need to invest time and energy in organizing and helping to organize service sector employees. So this gets back to what to do about organized labor that David was talking about. I think here at Princeton there are things that we can do. So we can support the uh, thousands, hundreds of service sector workers who work at Princeton who are unionized, who at times may confront Princeton. Uh, and we as students and as, as faculty and uh, as workers here also should support those workers. And we can support workers in Princeton Township and across New Jersey. So this goes to raising the minimum wage. Uh, this goes to ensuring that service workers are better protected, they have employee protections. All of those things, all of those political, uh, all of those uh, policies, I think would empower uh, people who no longer see the American political system as right for them. But I also think we should change how we value that work. So I think we should see working 40 hours a week at Walmart as just as dignified as a career or dignified as a profession as working 40 hours a week in a factory making cars. I don't think there's any difference between those two lines of work that justifies treating one set of workers differently than the other. Um, I think there are certain causes uh, for why we do that. So in part, it's based on our history. I think in large part, too, it's because a lot of service sector work is the people who are employed in it are usually people of color and usually women. So service sector employment has a higher percentage of women in the workforce. And so for me, this hints that the way that we think about work ties into the way that we think about the people doing that kind of work which necessitates important conversations about race, around gender, around how we race and gender work, and what we can do to kind of change the impression of what people are thinking about when it comes to the kind of work that they value, the kind of work they think of as dignified. Um, and I think if we do that, and I think if politicians start doing that, we'll see a much higher participation of people in the American political system. So. So uh, my name is Heath. Uh, I'm going to just tell you three stories that uh, work with um, what Brandon and David were talking about. So <clears throat> I did a year and a half of ethnographic and archival research in Clifftown. That's an anonymized town name. It's in South Jersey. Um, and so uh, the three stories are first, I want to tell you a little bit about Clifftown, and then I'm going to tell you about a woman named Megan, and I'm going to tell you about a man named Mitch. So in Cliptown, for the first couple of hundred years after the people who settled the area had killed all of the indigenous people or forced them into other parts of the country, became a place that was high in agricultural output. So by the time World War II happened, the largest uh, frozen vegetable farm in the entire world was located in this little rural town in South Jersey. And they signed all of these lucrative contracts with the government to ship frozen vegetables overseas, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So into the course of the mid-20th century, as agriculture took on new shapes and new forms, uh, everything in the town reoriented and the land got ordered for different purposes as it has in so many other places. So during this time, the, the farming was dwindling out and pieces of the property were being sold off. And then the factories themselves that had come up in the early parts of the 20th century were also starting to shutter. So that by the time the 80s came around, all the factories uh, uh, had been closed down and most of the farming had been condensed into a few smaller kinds of farms rather than this, than this massive scale. So at this time, of course, some of the farmland got sold to Walgreens, to Walmart, to Wawa, to you, you name it, all of the sort of corporate flagships that, that we know of came to, to populate right on the outside of this little rural town of about 19,000 people. The other thing that happened in addition to this was that two properties were sold, one to the state and one to um, the federal government for prisons. So there's a state prison there and a federal prison now. And the county jail is in the process um, currently of becoming the Southern Regional Correctional Facility, which would be the largest correctional facility in the state of New Jersey. 
So in this little town of 19,000 people, we have three correctional facilities. And the town next door to this in the same county has two more correctional facilities. So within a very small radius, um, in a short amount of time, it they were able to transition the land to be ordered around correctional facilities in some way as the place to get the best jobs, the most high paying jobs, consistent, um, they're protected, they have great benefits, all these kinds of things. A uh, corrections officer in Clifftown starts off at double the salary that a teacher does in, in the public school, for example. So it's a very lucrative job. Uh, you make well into six figures by the time you've uh, reached a decade of, of employment. And so all of that has been happening in Bridgeton, and at the same time that that was happening, laws were being passed in rapid succession that made little kinds of differences. For example, in the downtown area, which is a little downtown, three or four square blocks, you have all of these Victorian kind of uh, downtown buildings that have been there for 150 years, and um, the second and third floors historically have been rented out to uh, people, little one bedrooms. So in the mid-80s, those became, uh, uh, you could no longer live in those spaces. So that, of course, made it more difficult to get affordable housing, but the other thing that it did was it put the impetus for running a successful business in the downtown exclusively on running the successful business rather than being able to cover your mortgage through rentals uh, to, to aid your business ventures, right? So of course, uh, with all of the other things that happened over the next five years, the downtown became a kind of ghost town. Uh, all the properties were purchased by white people who live in other parts of the state uh, or country. And so um, that has been in, in a state of transition. So that's kind of the picture of, of the downtown of this, of this small rural area. At the same time, the population went from 70% white people in the 60s to what it is today, which is 14% white people. Um, and it's been primarily black and brown populations that have moved into the space. So we have these crazy radical shifts over the course of four or five decades that have happened all, all at the same time. So that's, that's a quick overview of Cliptown itself. And so I want to tell you briefly about Megan. Megan is a white woman in her mid-40s. She has her JD. She lived in Washington, D.C. for over a decade. She ran for Congress. She married a man who was from Cliptown, and uh, about five years ago, they moved back into town when he got a job in the public school system as a principal. When she came in, she didn't have any um, specific employment, so she decided to change gears a little bit and open up a nonprofit that was aimed at um, eradicating child hunger, specifically within this area. So during that time, she started volunteering at the county jail, not even either one of the prisons. She started volunteering at the county jail, and she realized that there is this thing called incarceration happening at a rapid pace in the United States. So she started reading about uh, state prisons and federal prisons and, and more broadly about incarceration in the United States. And so she became very uh, eager to, to make a difference. So she started a few more nonprofits. And um, she, she aimed them at the county jail and, and helping people with families and food and, and all of these different kinds of things and primarily helping with education, trying to bring an education program into this county jail. So over the last three years, Megan has landed $165 million of grant funding. So she was able to purchase this huge majestic building in the downtown area. She's in the process of renovating it. She runs multiple nonprofits out of this thing that are aimed at uh, you know, everything from, from child hunger to housing to educational opportunities to prison reform. All of these kinds of things are operating out of this. And her, her thing is, I, you know, I want to make a difference. I want to help people. I, I especially want to help people who are, who are trapped in the mechanics of, of our justice system in, in the United States. Um, she's, uh, she's a person that I, I got to know very well and became very close with. And she said, over the next 18 months, my goal is to get another $100 million of grant monies um, um, to, uh, to expand the nonprofits that I'm running out of this building. So uh, I met with her a couple of weeks ago. We had these great conversations. She was telling me about all these numbers. And uh, you know, I said goodbye, finished lunch. I walked across the street, which was uh, where my one of my closest friends from my field work um, 
runs a men's clothing store. So same, you could throw a rock through the window, but that, that wouldn't be cool to do that. But you could if you wanted to from, from one to the other. So I walk in to see Mitch and uh, he gives me a hug and um, we, start, we start talking about what's going on. So Mitch is an African-American male in his mid-50s. He spent his entire life in Cliptown. His parents spent their entire life in Cliptown, and his grandparents moved to Cliptown to Lynch and Crow South. So they've been there for a long time, going on 100 years now. And uh, Mike became an adult in Cliptown right at the moment when all the factories were disowning everything, when the, the agricultural possibilities um, had, had greatly diminished, and where drug policing had ramped into full force sort of in the mid-80s under the Reagan era and then of course exploding under the Clinton um, um, era. And so uh, in, in that time, in, by the time the mid-90s came around, uh, Mike picked up a drug charge. Now he never had to spend time in prison. He spent 17 days in county jail, which was enough to say, I'm never going back to that place. But he, he never spent time in, in either one of the prisons or in any other prisons in the state. However, he was given a felony, of course, which I know probably everyone here knows what that means and, and the kind of problems that that brings up. But Mike was given this felony, and despite the fact that he had grown up in the town, that people love him, that he has all of this kind of support and people that know his family, he was unable to land a job because... By the time the mid-90s were there, of course, all of the downtown businesses and most of the local businesses had been shuttered because they could no longer remain open. And those had been replaced on the edge of town by the Walmarts and the Wawas and the Walgreens and all of these kinds of things. And Walmart doesn't give a shit who your parents were. It's just policy. So every single interview that Mitch had over the course of the next 18 months ended with the exact same story. We'd love to hire you but I'm sorry, you have a felony, and it's just policy. And so it got to the point where he had, no, he had literally no opportunities in which he could earn money. So he decided to open his own men's clothing store. And uh, he found a building, it was owned by a man who lives on the Jersey Shore, and he was able to afford the rent, and, and he landed a job at McDonald's at the same time that he picked up a lease on this building. So for 18 months, my, as my, uh, Mitch says, he was flipping burgers and paying rent on an empty building. And finally, after 18 months, he was able to save up enough from working hourly wage at McDonald's uh, to open up the store to get a small um, bit of clothes and hats and shoes and all these kinds of things in there. And he's been running that now for years. Um, but every single month, at the end of the month, it's, it's a question mark whether or not he's going to be able to pay the bills and keep going the next month. And so he was explaining how dire um, the situation has become in the last five months when I was with him last week. And we sat on, on in front of his store uh, in plastic chairs, as we usually do, watching traffic go by and talking about random things. And Mike said, I'm too damn old to be flipping burgers. And the structural capacity for enforcing income inequality in that moment of Mike's words to me became so radically felt on the skin. Because here I, here I was from Princeton with all of the things that come with that, sitting on this chair with my friend Mitch, listening to him tell a story about how he just wants to pay rent and eat. And I had just left, right, this, this person who I am also close with, who is also doing great work in the world, who's, who's talking about these hundreds of millions of dollars of grant money that she was able to secure to help people who have been hurt by incarceration and structural inequality in the country. So I'm going to leave that there. And I don't know what we're doing yeah, so, so, we, so we kind of want to open it up for kind of a conversation about inequality, things that you sort of struck you, things that you might have more questions about. Um, 
many people want to come up? Because it's hard to see. Yeah, if you want to uh, from behind the, the, the cross beam there. Yeah. Oh, okay. Um, I'm curious how has the uh, how have race relations played out within the labor movement over the course of its history? I'm wondering if the strengthening of the labor movement through the uh, 30s and 40s uh, and so on were in any way aided by. Um, you know, a homogenous racial settling in various areas and homogenous lines of work taken up by those people aided legally by segregation, etc. So that's 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 a really, really good question. That's a really, really big question. I'm going to try to do it. The, the, the reason why I ask is, given the changes in the uh, uh, racial makeup of the country in urban as well as rural parts uh, today, uh, although some parts of it are still there, the effects of redlining and so on. I'm wondering how much of the heyday of the labor movement can really be replicated today, given the changing demographic distributions and the changing demographics overall. Well, on that point, actually, um, and, and I wanted to, and this is good because it, it builds on, on, on Brandon's presentation, part of the reason why um, labor was so committed to uh, easing restrictions and organizing efforts in the late 1970s is because they were aware of the changes, the broader changes in the economy going on, so the deindustrialization, the shift to a service sector economy. Um, and there was a realization that in order for organized labor to be sustainable in the future, that those sectors would have to unionize. Um, and uh, there were there have actually been some important successes. Healthcare workers, particularly in New York, uh, Philadelphia, uh, and other parts of the country, uh, jobs that remain disproportionately uh, done by minorities and women are now unionized. Um, but it was never really enough to kind of, um, the political power and the economic power was never there to kind of uh, transform that into a solid, a sustainable middle class uh, job like, like um, uh, manufacturing was at the height of uh, trade unionism in the 1930s and 1940s. On the point about race, I mean, the labor movement, organized labor, particularly industrial organized labor in the United States, has had has a very, very, very long history of um, segregation and uh, discriminatory practices. Uh, there have been a number of books written about how this looks uh, in Detroit, uh, in the auto industry. Uh, Tom Chagru, The uh, Origin of the Urban Crisis, is, I think remains the, the, best, the best work uh, of this. Um, <laughs> but paradoxically, at the same time, uh, the UAW and other labor unions were also the prime funders of the civil rights movement. So there's always been this tension in organized labor around the issues of uh, race and gender. Um, so yeah, as to whether or not it's, it's because of homogeneity uh, that organized labor was able to achieve such uh, traction in the 1930s and 40s, um, I, mean, I mean, that argument is made. I, I personally don't buy it because it supposes that um, uh, it supposes that the um, real tensions and differences between the various white ethnic groups in the 1930s and 40s, so Greeks, Italians, Jews, etc., um, were uh, were essentially not important. But in, but in actuality, they were, and a lot of work was done to kind of uh, bring all of these groups into the labor movement and, and have them be politically effective. In, Sort of a collective. So I, th I think it's possible, but the problem is, this remains the problem, is just labor law in the United States. I mean, this, this is kind of what I was getting at with my presentation, that it is very, very difficult to form a labor union in the United States, much more difficult than in other uh, uh, Western countries. Um, and so therefore, it just, I mean, that's the reason why, you know, Walmart isn't unionized. Um, why, why, why all of the corporate chains that Brandon and Heath talked about in their presentations I mean, uh, there has been a resistance to unionization in those industries for their entire existence. Um, and until federal labor law changes, I don't know if you're going to see successes there. And there are, and there are real political consequences to that because it contributes to the sort of disenfranchisement of working class people in the United States. Well, I'll be. Is that a question? Yeah. Um, I'm curious about the 
that the main mechanism you see going forward? Is, I mean, I think worker organization is important, but raising the minimum wage would go a long way to helping people help themselves. You know, affordable care for all helps with the benefits. Is that, are there new mechanisms? Yeah, the, so the, the future of, of organized labor, I think, is still up in the air. I think various unions have expressed certain uh, differences about it. Um, so SCIU, I know, doesn't see collective bargaining, has kind of given up or thinks collective bargaining isn't necessarily a good strategy to raising the benefits of workers. But without collective bargaining, there's no organizational structure for workers, right? Well, there would be if we had a political party. So, 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 in, so, so in part, in part, uh, what SEIU is 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 sort of hinting what at by saying that? SEIU is the Service uh, Service Employees International Union. Um, they're one of the lead service sector unions. So they organize fast food workers. They organize graduate students. They organize home health aides, they organize nurses, they organize a whole bunch of uh, various service uh, janitors, also a good one that they do. Um, there's a union back in the service sector and a union on this campus. I see. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So the, the uh, cafeteria workers are all represented by SCIU. I forget which of the service workers, but a big chunk of them are represented by SCIU here. So I think that's why a political party makes a lot of sense and why a political party could have a lot of traction. Uh, so I didn't necessarily, I didn't mention it, but in fact, poor folks who don't vote tend to actually uh, support more liberal policies. So they want greater government in their lives. They want to raise the minimum wage. They think the rent should be taxed more. Um, and the fact that they're not represented electorally distorts our sense of what's politically possible in the United States. And there's a good argument to be made that the United States is just as liberal as any European country. The, we just don't vote. People who would support these sort of like large welfare state policies don't vote, don't participate. Um, the fact that 50% uh, more or less of people don't vote, uh, given the election, um, particularly at the local and state level, a local political party with a pretty progressive agenda could probably pick up seats, could probably be pretty competitive in a state like New Jersey or a state like Maryland. Can I build on that point? Yeah. Um, so the Philadelphia's got. The, I forget the name of the organization, but it's basically one of the Philadelphia Socialist Parties has actually embarked on this as their sort of organizing strategy uh, post Donald Trump. Um, the Philly City Council is an at-large city council, which means that you know people around the city vote, and um, the largest party gets three, uh, three seats in the council. The, uh, the second largest party gets two seats on the council, and then there are also ward uh, reps as well. Um, and basically what the Philly Socialists are trying to do is to supplant the Republican Party as the second largest party in the city of Philadelphia so that they will have socialists on the city council as opposed to more conservative GOP reps. I have a question um, about, <clears throat> you mentioned, you kind of decided to talk about technology in the beginning and later on you mentioned education. But I'm curious about, I'm um, also in social mobility. Um, you said you wanted to ignore it, um, technological innovation and you said perhaps, I'm trying to figure out how this all, I mean, basically comment on this, how it all ties together, social mobility, technological innovation, and education. Because I've heard a lot of politicians or whatever talk about educating people. What are we educating them for exactly? And I think the, when, I, when you talk about unionization and workers, you're mostly talking about service industries. So is the solutions that you're sort of thinking of mostly centered around organizing and improving the livelihoods of people in the service industries? Or do you expect them to move to something else, and I'm curious, what is this other thing? If technology is removing manufacturing, or removing a lot of these jobs that used to exist. Yeah. So, so I think that part of the question I bet is coming from this question about automation and what automation will do, even in the service sector. I mean, if anybody's been to, say, the Panera across the street, you see they have the digital kiosks where you can order now, so they probably shed a worker or two because they no longer need someone up at the cash register. I don't buy the automation. Uh, explanation for the end of work because there's just a lot of jobs we still need to do. Uh, there's just a lot of work that still could happen. And this, I think, goes to David's point, it goes to Heath's point, it goes to my point, which is that how we decide how we're going to work and how we're going to live, these are political questions. They're not just economic questions. They are not just questions that can be answered by reading the tea leaves of the market. They're questions we actually have an intentional power to solve. Um, 
Yeah. Could you give me examples then? Okay, so for instance, uh, Princeton sits on a $20 billion endowment and could hire 100 new faculty. Those new faculty would start spending money, you, businesses would improve, right? You have teacher shortages across the country, um, right? Students are in 30, 30 student classrooms with teachers. You probably would need to hire thousands of teachers to make up for the deficit we have in teachers. Most governments are much smaller, so state, local, and federal government is actually much smaller than what the needs would be uh, for the population. We should probably do a lot more hiring at that level. Um, uh, so it's really on you know, processing a social security claim. That can take anywhere from six months to a year. That's kind of ridiculous. We should be able to have enough people working uh, in the government so that if you have a social security problem, you can get a result you know, in a month or two. Uh, we don't have that yet. And so, in some ways, the, the, the lie that conservatives have tried to push about the economy, and Democrats to some degree have bought it, is that in the status quo, if we have automation, then we have a no-work reality. But the status quo isn't really the kind of thing I think we should be shooting for. I think we should uh, take the problem of what kind of work do we need. So even somebody uh, as conventional as Larry Summers came out and said, you know, we actually do have a lot of need for work. We have old people who need taken care of. We have people with disabilities who need taken care of. We have tons of children who need taken care of. I mean, state-provided daycares would help, you know, the average worker, uh, you know, a lot. Uh, it would hire a lot of people, right, to provide uh, child health care. You know, pre-K, providing state-mandated state pre-K. Uh, you would have, like I said, hundreds of new teachers, thousands of new teachers, teaching assistants, facilities being built. There's plenty of work to be done. We're actually not in a low work, zero work environment at all. But just to clarify, most of those jobs are, you would maybe classify them as service jobs still? And well, yeah, yeah, actually on that point, I think the term service job, service sector work needs to be, we need to understand it very, in a very expanded sort of sense. Mike Davis, who's a prominent, uh, I don't even know how you would classify him, he's a prominent scholar at, I believe, the, at, University of uh, California, Los Angeles, has written about service sector work as encompassing everything from management consulting to law mm -hmm. to, I mean, uh, to uh, working at McDonald's. So basically, work in which you are providing a service, not a manufacturer, <coughs> in exchange for money. By that definition, I'm a service sector worker. Now, I teach. I'm a graduate student here. I teach at this university. I'm paid for my services. Um, so I think I think that kind of conceptual shift might might help if if we're all kind of. That's not to say that all of the work that we're doing is the same, but it all falls into this broad category of service sector work. I also think it's important to touch, just to, to emphasize a little more with what Brandon was saying was, there's a logic operating that allocates uh, specific job opportunities in specific places, even if we think from a governmental level, right? Like we can expand the police, for example, in Chicago, and at the same time we, sh we shut down multiple public schools and fire thousands of teachers. And so there's a real logic shift that can also happen and we can say like, oh, we have roads that need built, we have bridges that need repaired, we have massive state and national parks that could use all kinds of helps, right? So there's like an actual kind of logic that we're operating within right now that prioritizes lower taxes for wealthy people and uh, military expansion while getting rid of public services like educational opportunities, museums, parks, these kinds of things. And so it's not just about saying, could we have more jobs over here? It's also about saying, what is the logic that's structuring the, the, the way that we even prioritize what gets done in this country and how, how it means to hire people and expand? And, and, and that hints at the level of inclusion politically. So when's the last time you heard a politician say they were going to invite somebody who worked at a Chili's restaurant to sit on an economic council or to sort of talk about their experiences in that person? You don't. You know, by and large, poor folks have been shut out of the technical conversations around what it means to be a worker in the United States. Um, and both parties have done it. Uh, both parties don't seem... Uh, at least interested in changing that, but I think that the more that we recognize the lack of voices, the lack of perspective from poor folks in politics, I think it it uh, behooves us to then find ways to include those voices. Actually, just to respond to this uh, turn of the discussion toward 
the issue of there not necessarily being a lack of work for people to do, but perhaps more that the issue is that there are many jobs that need to be done, but due to various structural issues, I guess, they're going unfilled due to lack of social, social, socioeconomic or geographic mobility, those sorts of things. Why would a uh, shift toward stronger unionization or something of that nature necessarily be the best way to address that if you were to compare it to say maybe not a full-blown minimum income plan but some sort of subsidy directly to the people to encourage them to move where the jobs are and to retrain for new jobs so that way they have geographic as well as economic sector mobility or alternatively to uh, shift policy toward um, creating more competition uh, in the private sector through greater enforcement of anti antitrust laws and stuff like that, which would then also drive up wages given the number of companies that would be competing for workers and would be able to help in that way in terms of uh, bringing up their wages as well as creating opportunities that may not exist right now just because there are more players on the supply uh, on the supply side of the economy. So um, I think that's a great point. Um, and I think the anti-monopoly point in particular is, is a really important one. I want to come back to that in mm -hmm. just a moment. Uh, the problem with simply uh, uh, bringing people to where the work is, is that that happens already to a certain extent. It happens in Manhattan, it happens in San Francisco. There was just an article in The Guardian about this, published I think yesterday, two days ago, maybe even today. Um, about uh, out-of-control housing prices in San Francisco. I mean, I'm sure there are some people in this room, especially undergrads, who might be thinking about going into tech and have looked into what housing conditions are, housing prices are in the Bay Area. It's insane. It's worse than New York City. And New York City is not, is not good by any sort of imagination. So there's a problem with entry costs. Um, that, that I, I don't know if um, just jobs retraining and relocation subsidies are necessarily good. I mean, you may need more than that. Right. Uh, right. But but the broader question I think is this: um, we have all we have a lot of I think good policy ideas that have been circulating around this conference and things like it. How do you do it? And you need to be politically organized to do it. And um, I, I'm not saying uh, organized labor is the only force that can do this, but it has been the one that has worked in the past. Uh, and the decline of organized labor being directly tied to the explosion of these social problems. Uh, suggests to me that there is some kind of balancing mechanism that needs to be uh, reestablished. It doesn't have to be old organized labor. It shouldn't be old organized labor because it had its serious problems, particularly with issues of race and gender. Uh, but it has to be something. You know, there's a story about FDR um, meeting with union leaders back in the 1930s, and they proposed <coughs> things like Social Security. They proposed things like the universal health insurance, uh, minimum wage laws, national minimum wage laws. And he said, you know what, great. Uh, now make me do it, meaning get organized political pressure so that I am rewarded for doing the right thing, which I want to do anyway, but I can't politically unless you're pressing me. The, the other thing about the, the, the premise of your question, and I think it's interesting if we want to get sort of wonky about where the policy should go, but I want to emphasize that I think that we need to move away from thinking that we can sort of manage the economy and that it will sort of address the lives of people who weren't necessarily in the room when making those decisions, that we need to shift towards a more, a really, to a, a political system that's more inclusive to the lives of poor and working class people. And the minute that we do that, perhaps a lot of these policy questions will be easy to solve. But perhaps a lot of these policy questions won't make a lot of sense. Um, maybe they, I mean, we've been trying to run the economy uh, without talking to poor and working class people for a long time, and their lives have just gotten worse. Um, as a result, they, you know, they, they make less money than they do. They have less opportunities. Um, I think it's, I think it, it, it suggests that, in fact, bringing them into these policy discussions, uh, removing the kind of technocratic barriers to, to entry in these discussions is kind of what's what's needed first. And I think the solutions would follow from that. I want to interrupt at this point and say uh, we have about four minutes left, so uh, should think about wrapping things up. Yeah. Just a comment kind of on what you were saying about all of the potential work that's out there. It's, it is essentially all of that work that's not 
highly valued and usually done by people of color and women. Yeah. Right. So in addition to sort of all these structural changes, there has to be some change in how we think about that work. Right. Mm -hmm. and it's a cultural shift as well. Just a comment on that. Yeah. I mean, when's the last time someone made a disparaging joke around you about someone doing a job that you know you think is you know, undignified, you know, when's the only, I mean, how do we think about work precisely, and, and, you know, specifically domestic work, I mean, women's work has been historically undervalued, and as it's become more and more commodified with home care workers, child care, teachers, like, uh, teachers are some of the most demonized, like, public employees these days, um, you know, nobody says teachers' lives matter, but people, people certainly rally around police officers for whatever reason, um, you know, LA County spends 52% of its budget on police. Um, and it's unclear that that's led to people being safer in LA, but education has taken massive cuts in California. Yeah, I was just gonna ask a follow-up question. Do you think that this idea of race and gender is the main source of the rhetorical difference between like, the respect accorded to manufacturing jobs and to like teachers or childcare jobs or maybe like you were talking about how black women make up the largest percentage of Walmart or other types of kind of like corporate service industry work. Or even there are other what are the other elements? I think it's intersectional. So I think it's I think it is it is it is it is the fact that folks are poor, the fact that women, the fact that people I think there's an intersectional analysis that need that's needed. Um, I think it also gets to uh, maybe something underlying service work is that it, it has the connotation of serving and thus not building. Um, and there's something about how that, those words and what those words connote in our head about what the value of a certain job is. Um, you know, people will often say like, oh, it's so easy to work at a restaurant. I don't know if anybody's worked at a restaurant, but it's not easy, right? <laughs> like it's hard work, 40 hours at a restaurant on your feet, taking orders, having to remember things, dealing with angry customers. There's emotional, physical, and intellectual labor that goes in there. But we don't think about it that way for some reason, um, unless you've done it, unless you've done the work, right? And so, but for some reason, we'll say, yeah, building a car is really easy. I mean, I've seen modern factories, you just press buttons. So, and it's a lot of intellectual labor, right? And most of the people who run modern day factories are well educated engineers. Um, but it's to say that the fact that we immediately can think of one job as more sophisticated than another, even when in fact it isn't. That's, I think, part of the culture we have to change, too. All right. Unfortunately, I do think we should wrap up. I think okay. the next teaching is trying to get in here oh. pretty soon. Uh, Thanks, everybody. Have a good time.